Okay, so I've kicked off the uh, recording. Hi, Tara. How are you? Good, good. She's a nice friend, lady, isn't she? Excellent. I think we can probably go ahead and kick things off a little bit now. It works. Well, welcome everybody all online and also in person there and, and uh, with our friends, David and Dr. Stedward. Um, we're welcoming you from all over the world, really, to join us today for this wonderful conversation, launching of the Stedward Talks. Um, so I'm Eli Wolf. I'm with um, Disability and Sport International. Um, worked on this work for more than 20 years with, with David and also our colleagues, Ted Fay and Mary Holmes. Um, also have academic appointments at Brown University and UConn um, in the area of inclusion, diversity, and sport management. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and introduce David Legg, and David, will, we're so excited and honored to have Dr. Stedward with us to launch these series of conversations, um, looking at the intersection of the Olympic and Paralympic movement. So we'll be able today to get some of the history, um, also look at some of the current and into the future. Um, so without further ado, I'll go ahead and introduce uh, David Legg, who's currently the president of the International Federation of Adaptive Physical Activity and also with Mount Royal University and has been an amazing leader in Canada and around the world for the Paralympic movement. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, David. And um, just a note, we'll be using the chat box, using the hashtag Stedward Talks. And I really just have an hour here for a kind of rapid fire, but exciting way to launch this. So I'll turn it over to you, David. Well, thank you. Thank you, Eli. Um, I'm glad you read my introduction just as my mother wrote it for you. Uh, it was very, very kind of you. Um, we're actually, so right now we're in Calgary, Calgary, Alberta, Canada, and we're at uh, Wind Sport at Canada Olympic Park, which hosted many of the events uh, from the Olympic Games when they were held in Calgary in 1988. And our conversation today is going to be about the intersection of the Olympic and the Paralympic movement. And some of the conversations actually that my colleague to my right here, Dr. Sedward, had with Juan Antonio Samaranch prior to even the International Paralympic Committee being created happened uh, here in Calgary at Canada Olympic Park. So it's, uh, it's an interesting uh, coincidence that we're hosting this first Sedward talk about the intersection of the Olympic and Paralympic movement from this location where some of those conversations took place in the late 80s. I, Eli, I had the good fortune of meeting you in 2004 uh, when you and I, when you were at Northeastern University and I was teaching at Dalhousie on a sabbatical and I had the opportunity to fly down from Halifax to Boston and hang out with you on uh, the Boston Marathon weekend. So I'm grateful that we had the opportunity to meet and do some of the work that we've done uh, ever since then. So thank you for you know, working with me on the, on the creation of these talks. This is a, a, a topic and an area that you and I have looked at and considered and thought important for, for since, since we first met in 2004. And I think it's a, 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 great, a great achievement that we've actually initiated this, if I, if I do say so myself. And we have our first speaker for the Stedward Talks being Bob Stedward. And I, I have to say that we are speaking in front of a live studio audience. And perhaps, yeah, perhaps, hang on, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to turn the laptop around right here. So, so we have, yeah, there you go. So we do have individuals that are here. I, when I originally put this out, I didn't think anybody would come. So I didn't even think about, you know, how we would, how we would broadcast it or I clearly I didn't uh, appreciate or understand the drawing power of uh, my guest and my, my good friend to my right here. So without further ado, because uh, certainly this is not, a, and it should not be about me. <laughs> um, Dr. Stedward, to my right, was my graduate supervisor uh, for my PhD, and I had the good fortune of uh, meeting in 1994 when I finished working at the Canadian Wheelchair Sports Association in Ottawa and made the long drive west to start my PhD um, at the University of Alberta. And at that time, Dr. Stedward was the president. He was the founding president of the International Paralympic Committee, which was officially created in 1989. Um, so not that long ago, uh, comparatively speaking. Um, number of roles, he was an IOC member, served as the president of the International Paralympic Committee for 
uh, 12 years, stepping down in 2002. Um, a breadth of, of knowledge, a breadth of history as it relates particularly to the topic that we were looking at in that intersection of the Olympic and the Paralympic movements, both prior to the creation of the IPC in 1989 um, and then leading up to the original agreement uh, between the IOC and the IPC that led to the, two, the one city, two bids, which has now been extended, um, if I have this correct, to 2032. Uh, so any city bidding for an Olympic or Paralympic Games leading up to 2032 would bid for both the Olympic and the Paralympic Games. So without further ado, um, I want to pass it over. And uh, Dr. Sidra, I'm going to start. So we've, we've talked a little bit about what the future is insofar of the IOC and the IPC just having recently renegotiated their contract and extending it to 2032. But I'd like you to take us back uh, to the earliest conversations from your recollection as it relates to this idea of a partnership uh, between the Olympic and the Paralympic movement. And I don't want you to go back so far as the Gutman days um, in the late 1940s when they hosted the Stoke Manville Games on the opening same day as the opening ceremonies of the London Olympic Games. But from your experience, uh, your involvement at the University of Alberta and in Canadian disability sport, and those earliest beginnings of the conversations between the IPC or the Paralympic movement and the IOC. Well, first of all, thank you, David, and thank you, uh, Eli, uh, for establishing these talks. Uh, hopefully, they'll grow and develop in, in the future. Uh, but I will take you back because I think we need to have a bit of an appreciation of how things uh, evolved prior to the creation of the International Paralympic Committee. Um, Sorry, just, just to interrupt, if you can hear the music in the background, the... <laughs> We're at, a, we're at Windsport, and there's an ice rink beside us, and they're doing figure skating. So you'll hear this lovely flowing music in the background. It's really actually, it was perfectly timed to start with Dr. Stedward's <laughs> presentation. Uh, anyway, I mean, I don't want to go back to uh, the early days of, uh, uh, of Stoke Mandel in 48. I'd rather go back to the 1943, to the beginning of the games in Canada, uh, where, it, uh, where it really had a a really solid to start at the rehab hospital in Winnipeg. But I really won't. If, you, if we look at our history and why IPC uh, was established and how it was established, we really need to look at 1976 when Canada hosted the uh, Toronto Olympiad uh, because that was the first time that we had other disabilities involved uh, in the movement of sport for athletes with a disability. And in conjunction with those games, what we saw is the evolution of national and international organizations representing the different disabilities, not representing a sport, by, but by the different disabilities. After that point in time, those different disabilities came together and created um, an organization called the International Coordinating Committee, ICC. The difficulty with that organization from many people's perspective was that it was not a democratic organization. It was made up of the president, the secretary general, and the technical officer from each of the international uh, federations, uh, whether it be visually impaired, cerebral palsy, uh, amputee, or spinal cord lesion. So we were still stuck in those days in a medical model, in a disability model, uh, in a non-democratic environment. So <clears throat> I became quite concerned with the future of our, our, our movement because we were really a mere fledgling caught within the superstructure of, of sport. And we really had to Fights for fight for our rights and recognition uh, along our historical line. Uh, as a result, um, when we changed the uh, structure in Canada to the International Federation of Sport Organization for Disabled, which is now the Canadian Paralympic Committee, uh, I put together a uh, proposal that looked at a whole new structure and governance for international sport for our athletes. <clears throat> we circulated it around the world, who would ever listen to it. And as a result, we had a, uh, our first 
gathering in Arnhem in, this, in the Netherlands who hosted our 80 Paralympic Games. And those were called the, Arm, the Arnhem Seminar. And at that meeting, 23 resolutions were created, primarily looking at a sports structure, looking at a democratic organization, looking at integration, uh, looking at representation by sport, not by disability, uh, looking at having representation uh, from the international federations, from the various sports, uh, and all of the nations of the world. So there were a whole series of um, resolutions, and one developing a relationship with the International Olympic Committee. So after the Arnhem seminars, I had an opportunity to meet with the president of the IOC at the time, uh, Juan Antonio Samranch, uh, here in Calgary. Uh, I told him about our vision, our mission. I told him about what we're trying to accomplish in trying to develop a close relationship with the International Olympic Committee, uh, trying to look at um, uh, working with the existing Olympic host organizing committees to have both games under one umbrella. Mm -hmm. And so, so, so just, just so I have the timelines right. Mm -hmm. So 76, Toronto hosts the Toronto yes. Olympiad for the Physically Disabled yeah. Multidisability. Yes. 1980, Arnhem hosts the Paralympic Games. Um, right. The Olympic Games were held in Moscow that year. Correct. The Arnhem Seminars. So it was in 87. It was in 87. So again, seven years had passed. So the 84 Games took place, the Paralympic Games in both New York City and in Yeah, Stokemando. well, we had difficult. The original Games were set for uh, Illinois. Uh, however, there were some difficulties there, one being they were more keen about holding um, the wheelchair games for spinal paralyzed, not the other disabilities. Mm -hmm. New York stepped forward. Uh, the games left uh, Illinois and went back to Stoke Mandel for 84. Right. Right. Okay. So then in 88, uh, we're... Well, well, hang on. Let's, let's, so, let's, so in 87 then, we're back, we're back in Arnhem yes. for the Arnhem Seminars. And at this yeah. point in time, you are, what's your role then? My role, I was uh, president of the uh, Canadian Federation of Sport Organizations for the CF, 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 which ultimately became, CPC, CPC. became the Paralympic Committee. Yeah. And that's where the conversations took place, talking about an international organization that's correct. to represent disability. Now, what I want to know is, the, because I think there's some, uh, I, I've never seen conclusive, well, that's, that's not true. I want to talk about the conversations that led to um, in part, the, the Arnhem Seminars and this idea of creating an umbrella organization to represent all disability uh, sport. Okay. <clears throat> well, as I said, at the time, the organization that was responsible for international sport for our athletes was the ICC. Right. Uh, but again, uh, we in Canada and myself personally felt that there needed to be more of a uh, global organization that's represented presented by the nations of the world and not by five or six independent federations internationally. Now, so, was, there, was there pressure from the IOC to do this as well? Uh, well, there was a little bit of pressure at the time because uh, the president at the time, uh, President Juan Antonio Samranch, uh, he was certainly prepared to meet with uh, the organizations representing uh, disability sport, but he was only prepared to look, meet with one. He didn't want to have six different groups coming in with six different requests uh, for their own independent organizations. So that's when our proposal from Canada went forward to all the nations saying, look at this, Do, is this viable? Is this a, the way, the direction we should be going? Uh, we then had uh, conversations with the International Sports Fund. Which was which was a which was a very good fund in the Netherlands in Arnhem, which uh, was the money left over from the Ar Arnhem Games in 1980. Okay. So they said they would host a meeting of the nations, okay. and other nations could bring forward their proposals for a new structure and governance as well. So that's when everyone else came to those meetings, put together their personal uh, or their national interests. Um, at our, the Arnhem seminars in March of and so that would have included representation from athletes with spinal cord injuries, mm -hmm. athletes with visual impairments, athletes with cerebral palsy, yes, uh, athletes with amputation, 
Yes. Uh, what about uh, the, where, where is special? Olympics? And INUS was part of that, the International Association for Mentally Handicapped. They were part of as well. Special O was not okay. because the international body representing uh, sport for athletes with uh, mental illness, mentally handicapped was INUS, FMH. Okay. And then what about um, deaf sport? Where did it fit in? They, they, they had already developed a, re, a bit of a relationship with the International Olympic Committee, but they became involved with the IPC after 89, after we were created as an okay. organization. So they, weren't, so they weren't part of the conversations in 87? No, they weren't. No, okay. they, they were not. So, and at those, at those meetings, I said, those 23 resolutions, uh, and they're all well documented, and it's quite interesting to see where we're at now from where we came from those 23 resolutions. It's quite, quite an interesting flow of uh, history over that period of time. Uh, but if we can jump forward to that 87 meeting with Samaranch here in, in Calgary. Was that uh, before or after the Arnhem Centers? That was after. Okay. So we knew the resolutions because at the time, uh, though that's, uh, that Arnhem Seminar created um, a, a, not a task force, but appointed, elected a committee to start <laughs> looking at a constitution and bylaws for a new organization. And there was representation from the uh, from the six international five or six international federations, uh, as well as the six regions of the world uh, that came together, and they were responsible for bringing back uh, this constitution and bylaws. When I met with the president of IOC in Calgary, uh, I so that told, was leading up to the games here in Calgary. Is that why? that's correct? Yes, so because he happened to be in Calgary, so it was a good opportunity. Uh, for me to come and, and meet with them, and so. But you weren't, and you weren't representing anybody at this point in time. You were just a, no, no. I was just nosy. <laughs> <laughs> I just no. I was just. I. I mean, it was just fact of perseverance. I, we needed change. I wanted change. I felt we. And he was going to be in uh, Canada, and particularly Calgary at the time. So I thought the timing uh, was right to uh, to meet with him. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> After our meeting, I had indicated to him that, that we have this wonderful proposal to look at bringing our two, not bringing our two movements together at that time, but to create a new singular democratic uh, global organization. So he said, great, show it to me. Uh oh, I didn't have it with me. <laughs> I was just trying to you know, trying to explore all sorts of opportunities. So that's he, the, so you're the one who taught me to do that. Yes. To promise something and then, oh, I'll figure it out later. Figure it out later. Oh, right. But the difference is, <laughs> I figured it out later. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, as a result of, of that meeting, uh, he, uh, President Samranch, invited me to Korea, to Seoul, Korea. Okay, so this was during the Olympic Games or prior to that? Uh, it was during the Olympic Games in Korea in the summer of 88. Okay. Uh, and, that, and the reason being is that Korea was already putting together a uh, committee that was responsible for both the Olympic and Paralympic Games. Really the, the first time in our history where we saw that, and that was happening before the IPC was even created. So arguably that's why Calgary didn't host the Paralympic Games from a winter perspective, in part because that precedent had not yet been set until that summer in Seoul. That's, yeah, yeah, I would, I would think so. I don't know, <clears throat> you know, what the real reasons here, because I wasn't part of that, hmm. uh, that discussion. But, so it was really an interesting meetings in, uh, in Korea. One, because uh, I had an opportunity to bring together the proposal to Samranch and the IOC for their consideration. He was very pleased with what we were attempting to do. And also he wanted to continue discussions as we moved along with the formal inaugural General Assembly of IPC. So a week later, the Paralympic Games were in, in Seoul. And that was where the, uh, the committee, I guess we can call it, who was putting together the constitution and bylaws was to bring forward a report for further discussion and hopefully some implementation. But that was 
the most difficult meeting I've ever attended. First of all, you have the room filled with representatives from around the world that are there basically to take care of their teams. So they've got worries about their Paralympic teams. On the other hand, they're trying to think and talk and discuss and make some decisions with regards to the future uh, of our family. And the discussions were very difficult. They got very heated. They were very close to being out of control. And I got to the point, stuck my nose in there again. and Because you weren't chairing these meetings. No, oh, gosh, no. No, I was, <laughs> I was a back. But if I was chairing it, I would have steered it in a different direction. But I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't. I was, so there was no elected president or chair? At this no, time? it was. Well, actually, Hugh Glynn from Canada was chairing the committee that was bringing this together. Hmm. And uh, so, but I'm not sure, I think Carl Vang from Norway was chairing hmm. the meeting. Uh, and so we got together at that meeting and I stood up and I said, look, I said, all of you people have so much responsibility with your own teams. We're not gonna resolve anything here. Rather than trying to make a rash and hasty decision right now, why don't we table this discussion, set a date for the inaugural General Assembly and. September 21st, 22nd of 1989 in, in Düsseldorf, and we'll make a decision then where we can focus on the meeting. And was the IOC involved in any of these conversations at this no, point in time? No, the, well, the, no, not, in, not directly involved in those. That was basic uh, in-house discussions. Mm. <clears throat> they were certainly aware of them going on. Uh, and in fact, uh, over that next year, they uh, appointed a representative from the IOC, a member of the IOC, to sort of be the liaison between whatever this organization is going to be and the IOC. Mm -hmm. And he was also the president of the German Olympic Committee at the time. Mm -hmm. And so we, we put, it, put that date off to the next year. And then, of course, we brought forward again the resolutions along with the new structure and governance. But again, we got bogged down because structures and governance of different sporting organizations in different countries take into consideration language and cultural differences, et cetera, we weren't getting very far. So uh, again, we discussed the idea of let's not establish a full constitution bylaws. Let's um, elect an executive of this new organization and their responsibility will be to take the information we currently have developed and come up with the constitution and bylaws at a future general assembly. So that was everyone's satisfaction. Okay. So we would then went through the election process. Now automatically there were representatives on the uh, governing board, board of directors. There were the six regions from the world and they were responsible for appointing or electing those representatives. There was a representative from each of the international um, sport governing bodies. And this included the DEF at this point? Uh, not at, gosh, not at that point. Okay. But the, I think the meeting immediately after, because we had men meetings with the IOC, uh, who had recommended that we include uh, the DEF uh, sports mm -hmm. at that time. So that's when we elected uh, an executive. Uh, we had a president, which was myself. There were two vice presidents, um, Reiner Krippner from Germany, and I think perhaps oh, uh, Zoba al Rawi, who was uh, from Iraq. And then there was a treasurer, a secretary general, and a technical officer. So I think there were six or seven people. My memory's a little fading, you know, it was 30 years ago. Uh, so it was established. And so, as they say, from an organizational point of view of IPC and the Paralympic movement, the rest is history because then we started not only to lay the foundation for a new organization, but we also started really heavy meetings with the IOC uh, for a future relationship. Um, and remember, this, uh, those 12 years of my presidency, uh, I started with one uh, one woman who's still there, Lean Kudness, who was there part-time to facilitate the secretariat, 
And then I ended up with, I think, four staff when, uh, after I left uh, 12 years later. But you had tremendous graduate students that helped you a lot, I hear. Well, I did have, just before you came, I had a couple <laughs> or three that were, that were exceptionally good. Eddie, <laughs> and then I counted on my international friends like Eli Wolf and people like that. So it was, uh, it was very, very good. But, you know, during that period of time uh, from 89 to 90, I mean, we, you can't believe, a, a, you know, trying to build a fledgling organization into a noun organization that's one of the largest uh, organization, sporting organizations in the world. There were so many challenges because all the international federations were very overprotective of their own disability. And we wanted to have a sporting organization built on a technical sporting classification, not a medical classification. Mm. We wanted to build more professional professionals in the area of coaching and leadership, uh, because at the time, most of the uh, coaching and mentoring and that came out of hospitals and rehab centers. So it was very, very different. So right away, we had challenges from the international federations. They just did not want to change. So you had to have the kid gloves on just to try to shepherd that through. Right. And then building a relationship with the IOC. And, you know, I know many people, you know, may have had difficulties with President Samranch in the past. I had nothing but uh, great support from him. He was very supportive. We met very regularly, likely every two or three months, and then between times uh, met with uh, the former sport director, Gilbert Fali, and then about the mid-90s, and we, I also dealt a lot with uh, the uh, chair of the Solidarity um, as well. So that relationship started to go, and we were always building over those 12 years a formal memorandum of understanding. Well, and, as, and from a games perspective, that, that would have happened as well, in part because with the, with the Seoul Games being the first summer mm -hmm, games mm -hmm. to be held in the same city, same venues, <clears throat> yeah. and then that started happening in the winter games with, I believe it was Lillehammer or Albertville were the first ones in 92. Uh, in Albert, Albertville, 92. 92. Um, yeah. So from that point on, yeah. the same cities were hosting games, yeah. but not necessarily required. Exactly. And, and the nice thing about it, though, is that, uh, and that's why I guess I always refer to the 88 Summer Paralympic Games as the, as the modern Paralympic Games, because that's when the committee was responsible for both games. That's when there was a lot of cooperation within the organizing committee. When we met with, with Seoul, we were always meeting with the Olympic and Paralympic mm -hmm. organizing people in preparation for those games. And, and that's when we, we presented so, uh, IOC with our formal uh, proposal for, okay. for future relationships. So now, it worked out really well. I want now, you know, you, you suggested that your relationship with uh, Juan Antonio Samaranch was a good one and that your interactions with the IOC were positive. But there were certainly instances where I presume there must have been conflict uh, between the IPC and the IOC, and I'm not asking you to dish dirt or to uh, to try and point fingers, but I I'm, I mean even thinking for example, um, the the request to have demonstration status events um, yeah. in the Olympic Games and the creation of the Commission for the Inclusion of Athletes with a Disability, the request to have full medal status for the the wheelchair track events that had been yeah. had been included yeah. as demonstration events. Uh, an example being the logo uh, yeah. challenge yeah. Uh, yeah. with the five yeah. um, ajitos. Um, you know that the were you know apparently the looks from Korea. the Taegook, yeah. sorry yeah. that's right that looked yeah. like the Olympic rings I, like I know there must have been some challenges in, in working yeah with the well you've just mentioned you know the tip of the iceberg compared to what <laughs> we had to overcome I mean uh, I guess working in the area of, of disability we've always had barriers and and have always fought for independence our rights or recognition we've always had to overcome difficulties so this was nothing new for us uh, but absolutely I mean we had problems with the logo uh, there was ex an expression of concern from a couple of the NOCs that our logos were too similar to the rings it might adversely affect fundraising opportunities uh, so we agreed uh, uh, at our one of our uh, general meetings that we would alter the the logo uh, however for 88 92 94 
they would remain the same because it had already been it already been established and and certainly the chair of the uh, 94 games said that's the logo we're using because that's the logo that we agreed to use so they stayed there but then we reduced it by taking away two of the k groups to take it down to uh, to three so that uh, i mean and that worked uh, that worked uh, quite fine but there were all sorts of other areas uh, i mean when when we were looking at demonstration events in the various Olympic Games. The first demonstration took place in uh, 1984 in uh, Sarajevo in the Winter Games and then 88 here uh, and then 84 in the summer in, in Los Angeles. So there were a number of games but then we got into the dilemma of I was going back to the IOC, and this is where I was working more closely with Gilbert Fli. You know, do you think we could move those to full medal status? And then we got into, well, would it count towards the medals of the countries? And your organization isn't well developed yet. There's only going to be three or four nations that are really going to grab those medals. And and we also had problems within our organization. There was some there were some groups that did not in any way want to have even demonstration events. Mm. Uh, because every international federation wanted their own disabilities and their own sports, and the IOC just wasn't prepared to include that many people. Mm -hmm. You certainly couldn't have a team event, because as soon as you brought in something like uh, wheelchair basketball or, or goalball, something, now you're talking teams, many more people, as opposed to uh, it's much more simplistic to have a couple of track events or a couple of swimming events or, or what have you. So that was, we. I had problems both within our own organization and with the IOC. So over time, I guess we left them as demonstration. Uh, and they and the IOC eventually said, yeah, you can, you can have a little bit, but which one are you gonna have? Hmm. You know, and they gotta be controlled. They gotta meet the same criteria and standard as any Olympic athlete. So it was really challenging for us. Then we jump a few years later, of course, those dropped off in 2008 uh, in Beijing mm -hmm. at the Beijing Summer, Ga Summer Games. And, and, I, and I don't think that's a bad thing because a long time before that, we, ha we had a formal uh, relationship through the MOU signing in Sydney in 2000 with the IOC. Uh, and, and we had so many other issues through the 90s that we had to, that we had to resolve that uh, that wasn't uh, high on our priority. Okay. So I want to I want to return now to the '90s. Um, you made reference to um, your interactions with Juan Antonio Sam Ranch being semi-regular, and so he was the president during mm -hmm. that entire time. The Olympic and Paralympic Games were held in his home city of Barcelona. Um, the Atlanta Games were held not without controversy, in so far as mm -hmm. whether or not you know Atlanta wanted to host both games. But throughout this whole time, you're meeting with Sam Ranch and the relationship between the Paralympic and Olympic movements are becoming closer together, I could, I would argue. Oh, yes. Um, culminating, I guess, as far as your presidency goes, um, with the agreements signed soon after the Sydney Olympic and Paralympic Games between the IOC and the IPC. Yeah, and, you know, there was more than that. Leading up to the signing of the memorandum through the 90s, after I was elected as the founding president in 89, and the work more closely with the IOC, all of a sudden then we started getting representation on most of their commissions. So we had representation on environment. We start, later on we got it on the commissions uh, that were uh, monitoring the games, etc. So we were starting to get more and more involvement. Uh, uh, I was given opportunities at the uh, uh, Olympic assemblies to speak on behalf of the IPC and update them all the nations what we're doing why we're doing it where we're at where we're going how we're getting there etc mm -hmm. so those were those were very I think very well received uh, and as well any meetings that were held uh, with regards to the IOC we were uh, we were included somewhere somehow um, and so that's what strengthened our relationship because I didn't have to just get Sam Ranch on board. I had to get, you know, <laughs> 121 or 112 at the time IOC members on board. Right. And, uh, and that didn't certain, certainly necessarily happen. So let's, yeah, let's, let's, let's talk a little bit more about that. How was the, you talked about your relationship with Sam Ranch, but the IOC in general, the Olympic movement in general, 
how receptive were they to the idea of a Paralympic movement and a potential partnership between the two? Oh, I mean, I mean, it was it was a huge challenge. I mean, we were we were the fledgling organization out here trying to trying to become a member, and are we going to take something away from it? Is it going to cost them more money and time and effort and concern? So they had concerns and likely very legitimate concerns. Mm -hmm. So we had to certainly alleviate any fears that. We were our organ organization. We can take care of things, but we wanted to work with them to ensure that the Olympic and Paralympic Games uh, can work together for the success of both. Mm -hmm. uh, and I and I think we achieved that. There was always the debate: should they be uh, before the Olympic Games or after the Olympic Games, uh, uh, etc. And I was used to joke with my friends at the uh, IOC and said, well, we want to get the test event over with first be <laughs> before the Paralympics start. But, you know, uh, we had to develop good relationships. And, and, uh, and so I worked feverishly over my 12 years to not only build that MOU and our own organization, but to develop good personal relationships with IOC members. So I handpicked a few IOC members that I felt that I could develop a good relationship with who were influential within the IOC that could help me continue to grow uh, our efforts within the organization. And as well, we started to also meet with and develop relationships with other international federations because, again, we wanted to have inclusion, whether it be within tennis or athletics or swimming or any of those other international federations, so that we could uh, grow our sport, get involved in integration in international federations, and strengthen that relationship within the IOC. I just, I, I want to, there's some questions being presented to us online here, and I, the one I'm going to ask, and I'll try and get to all of them um, with yeah. the time we have remaining. So the one question um, is about your vision, and I guess, so we kind of tracked from your first involvement from a Canadian perspective and the Dusseldorf, uh, the Arnhem, the Arnhem Seminars, the decision at Dusseldorf where you were elected as president, and then your, um, your beginning negotiations with the IOC did, was from your original vision of where the Paralympic movement could become, has it, has it manifested itself? Has it, have, you know, during, particularly during your presidency, did you have to deviate from your vision? Um, did you stay true, mm -hmm. in the words of the, of the questionnaire, did you stay yeah. true to your convictions among all the hurdles and naysayers? Well, I think if you look at the movement today, <clears throat> it certainly far exceeded, you know, my goals and, and my dream, uh, for sure. Uh, however, Leading up to it, there were, uh, an, it's just like steering a big ship going across the ocean. You're going to bump into barriers. You just circumnavigate around them and get back on course. And, and I, one, I just persevered. You know, I just continued. If they, if they said no, I must have asked wrong. So you just find <laughs> another strategy. I always tried to stay very close to those 23 resolutions, which really incorporated what I was trying to achieve in my original document uh, to go before the mm. countries of the world. So I always tried to stay true to that. Certainly had to put the priority of someone a little bit differently because some were fairly easy to achieve. Uh, others were, were very, very difficult to achieve. And, and uh, so relationship building was really important to me. And, and that's where I spent you know, an awful lot of my time during my time as, as president. Hmm. So 15 years following uh, the end of your term as president, would you say that the International Paralympic Movement and Committee has stayed true? And I'm not asking you to point fingers. Hmm. Um, and I, this may be an awkward question, but has the movement stayed true to those original discussions that took place in 87 and 89? Well, I'm only one person. And, and while I may not necessarily agree personally that that they made the best decision or the right to say, well the best decision it's right or wrong it's, it's in the eyes of the beholder but <clears throat> there were certainly decisions that were made i thought 
could have been or should have been different. But again, I also realize we live in a world of change mm -hmm. and change is happening every day uh, rapidly and uh, we need to be part of that change or we're going to get left behind. And so uh, absolutely there were changes that took place that I didn't necessarily agree with personally, but I think have worked out. Uh, and I think the direction we're going uh, right now with, uh, is, is very good. Very good. It's, uh, it's, I mean, they're a huge organization. Now, when you've got 130 staff and, and many millions of dollars, I would have liked to have had 1% of that to, during my 12 years <laughs> uh, because it was very much a voluntary built organization. It had not yet become professional from the point of view where professional staff were. With the exception of your graduate students, of course. Right. Oh yeah, they were. Yeah, okay. they were. All right. Just, just that so sort of. Just so we're clear. Us, that kept yeah. us back a bit. But, <laughs> but that's okay. Okay. I, there's another question here as it relates to uh, sports that are cho chosen and how the IPC governs them, and again the relationship between the IOC and the IPC. And so far as you're thinking of, you know, should the IPC have responsibility for? specific sports or as the negotiation between able-bodied and sport for athletes with disability continues to merge, should the IPC loosen its mm. responsibility for certain sports? Well, I, I guess because my, my attitude originally has always been that all sports should operate within an integrated environment, uh, that should happen wherever possible, unless there are significant enough differences that just doesn't allow it to happen successfully. But every sport is at a different stage in their history and their, and their sophistication. And so we need to be concerned about that. We need to uh, make sure that we continue to have discussions between IOC and IPC, but more importantly now with the international federations. Mm. International federations are still responsible for their sports. Okay. And, uh, and, if, and if we can develop stronger relationships with the international federation, no matter what sport, the better off we'll be. Uh, mind you, I know that some federations um, for able-bodied sport find it difficult because they don't quite understand our, our history. Uh, we've only been in, in business for 30 years and they don't understand necessarily the sophistication and complexity of our classification system. Right, there right. are challenges there, but I still believe the it should it should be the sports that govern sports. Okay. And uh, the Paralympics is there, like the IOC, to host the Paralympic Games. Mm -hmm. Work with the organizing committees. Work with the National Paralympic Committees to host the very best successful possible games for for their athletes and leave the sport technical people to work with the sport experts in the international federations okay so eli i see the question about cultural shift so i'm going to ask that one if, and then yeah feel uh, free to go ahead if you want um being able to facilitate yeah it's great that you're taking the questions i think the one i was gonna, also going to ask about the impact of the crpd the un convention but yeah david why don't you do that first one and then we can do some of the other ones. It looks like we also have a question about the U.S. specifically, but. Yeah, so this, go this question, I'm going, to, I'm going to read this question word for word as it's been presented. So the IPC has developed a strategic priority to drive a cultural shift through parasport for a truly inclusive society. For example, the IPC plans to use parasport to advance the implementation of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Utilize the growing platform of para-athletes to highlight social barriers that are disabling people and cultivate a generation of para-athletes to act as advocates for disability rights. Does yeah, this to, just to add to that, that it's not only how it's used as a platform, but how, it had, how has the convention had an impact in terms of raising awareness of disability and so forth? Yeah. So I'll just, yeah, so the question <clears throat> finishes with, does this mixing of sport and politics conflict in any way with IOC agendas? For example, is there a ban on athletes from making political statements at sport events, et cetera, do the IOC want to distance sport athletes, sport and athletes from politics? So I guess the, the question for you is to consider about, you know, the Paralympic questions. movement. It's kind of two different questions, but yeah. Sorry, sorry, go ahead, Eli. I would say those are two different questions, but yeah, I mean, it'd be interesting to get the responses, yeah. So the first one is about the intersection of 
the Paralympic movement and social change um, and looking at it from a, a social rights, human rights perspective yeah. and its role and responsibility. And arguably the IOC takes on similar, the Olympic movement takes on similar roles and responsibilities, but perhaps not as, I don't want to say dramatic, it's perhaps not the right word, but as obvious. Well, uh, I certainly believe that that it's very important for our movement to be aware of change that are taking place in society because people with disability are facing this every day and where we can where we can be um, helpful here is that our athletes are such extraordinary great mentors uh, they're great role models uh, you look at their their success and it's not overcoming a disability it's nothing like that it's it's them themselves getting involved in sport doing the best they can following their dream and becoming role models for uh, other young children that are growing and developing and living with a disability and can their success as an athlete provide better opportunities for them Certainly, uh, and I, again, one of the commissioners I was on years ago with the IOC was, was with the United Nations on truce. Mm -hmm. So when we would go to some of these countries, uh, the most difficult conditions were the conditions that people with disability were facing in their countries uh, because of the laws of their land, because of their culture, be because of the educational and health and, uh, concerns in that. But the more we provide these countries with opportunities to grow and participate in sport, the more it can lead to becoming a change in their, in their country. So yes, I believe in that way, uh, we can be change agents. We can be helpful uh, in changing the social climates in, in um, many countries without becoming uh, politically interfering with what, what is happening. Right. And I guess you also have people with disabilities are everywhere. And people with disabilities are in the Olympic movement, you know, whether it's mental health disabilities or learning disabilities or, you know, disability is pervasive throughout. So it's, Absolutely. I think that's an interesting intersection of how, I mean, some, there's some athletes that are Paralympians and Olympians. I mean, so you kind of have these interesting intersections of where disability, especially here we are in 2019 and kind of the prominence, just like race and gender. And so disability is becoming more of a, of an important issue to address in our society. Well, I, th I think you're right, uh, Eli, and you know, and I'm quite happy and glad that I grew up within the first 10 or 12 years of the Paralympic movement and not today, because there are changes that are taking place and their dramatic effect on society are, are so, so much larger than I ever faced. I mean, basically, I had to get a new organization created and lay a, a strong foundation for which they could build off of. But the changes weren't nearly as diverse and, and as difficult as they, as they are today. And, and again, but again, they likely are saying or said the same thing about me uh, leading the IPC <laughs> in those 12 years because I lived uh, from 1968 to 89, you know, 30 years there. Uh, of uh, a different climate uh, as well because everything was very much built within the rehab center, the hospital and, and the medical model and it was very different mm -hmm. than it was my time which it is today. And, uh, and I, I'm just, uh, you yeah, know. It's really interesting. Yeah, it's amazing to see and contextualize where we are in our mm -hmm. time and our future versus where we were and all these changes. It's really important. So mm -hmm. yeah, thank you for addressing that question. I think it's I guess, so, Dave, you want to adjust the next ones? Yeah. Yeah, well, with the first, well, so this one is a quicker one. They want, people want to know what the pins are that you're wearing. Um, oh. Uh, and I think they're pointing out more than anything else that I don't have any. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, some graduate students make it, some just don't. <laughs> but uh, I guess the, the one at the top is uh, the highest civilian order you can get in Canada. I was appointed a an officer of the Order of Canada. Uh, the one on the one side is the uh, uh, Alberta uh, Order, and the one on the bottom is the Olympic Order. Yes. 
Uh, Should we address the question about the Olympic and Paralympic name? Yeah, so a couple questions came in and they're talking about the recent change in the United States um, mm -hmm. from the USOC to the USOPC, so the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee. Right. Now my understanding is there are four nations that now have that model. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing a little bit here. I think Netherlands is one. I think Germany's another. I think Norway is. Yeah. Did I get them all? Yeah. So those are the four. The name is unique. The, the, the fact that it's now the name, kind of had, does that have an impact and kind of for a future move the relationships, other countries and, yeah. I'm not so sure, uh, uh, Eli, that a change in name is going to make a difference. There has to be uh, a change in attitude. There has to be a change in governance. There has to be many of those mm -hmm. basic changes to, to help the Paralympics uh, uh, achieve what they want to achieve their their goals and objectives but there are many other countries uh, whose national Olympic committees the NOCs are responsible for their Paralympic program and their Paralympic uh, sports without changing a name and uh, they seem to work uh, very well I, I know in my earlier days of traveling whenever I went to a country there was no national Paralympic committee uh, I always met with the president or, and staff of the National Olympic Committee who were responsible for the Paralympic uh, movement in their country. Mm -hmm. uh, but so my only concern would be that with the change in name, is there going to be a change within the structure and governance of that organization so that all athletes in the country, whether they're uh, training to become Olympians or Paralympians, are going to benefit from that name change? Exactly. Yeah, that's a really good point in terms of how that, what it really means, you know, it's just the name and what's really being done. Could it still be an Olymp, you know, just so many different models out there, you know, and that's, I think that's really interesting to see that yes. evolution. Yes. Now, Eli, we're, yes. I, I know we only have nine minutes left, so I want to try and get to as many more questions as we yeah, can. Yeah, we have a couple more that are coming. Um, yeah. There's one, that, and are, are you still, uh, we're, we're getting a little for you. Are we, are, are we still connecting clearly to you? It's a little bit off, but it's okay. There's just, just recently, and there's been a little bit, but we're, we're doing okay. Okay. So this one question um, is about the merger between the IOC and the IPC and the Olympic and Paralympic movements, and whether or not this could translate into more inclusive sports. Um, so do we see a future where there's an opportunity for, and I, I'm trying to think if there are examples that already exist. Well, I, I think there have been examples of athletes with disabilities participating in the Olympic Games, but could like this be a marathon or something like that? Yeah. Yeah. So a more formalized approach whereby we start to incorporate events that are, are inclusive. An example being the marathon. So the Boston Marathon, mm -hmm. as an example, has been inclusive for many years. Uh, could other events in the Olympic format uh, take on that model? Could they? Sure. Who's going to lead it? Who's going to who's going to have the vision and and to develop something that can move forward? I mean, there may be an opportunity in some sports. I don't know, canoeing, <laughs> rowing, where you could integrate men and women, disabled, non-disabled. There may be other sports uh, like that, as long as someone is prepared to take those forward and and have them accepted within the International Federation and the Olympic movement. The Olympics, basically, I've always felt that whatever events or, or whatever, yeah, whatever events come forward is the decision of the sport, the International Federation. If they want to add a couple of events in athletics, then a couple of events are going to have to disappear because you're only going to have the formula is going to say you'll get so many athletes and so many events, etc. So something has to change because the sport, because the Olympics and the Paralympics are so large. That's why they'll never come together because they're just, they're just it's yeah. complex. Uh, uh, you know, the requirements and the size and are, are just too immense to ever to bring the two together. And the same thing if you start looking at other sports where where you can compete alongside in some way. Yeah, the marathon is a good example of that. I mean, but if you include 
athletes living with a disability to participate in the marathon, whether they, they be uh, individuals using a wheelchair or, or visually impaired or whatever, whatever classification you want to include, does that mean then you drop it out of the Paralympics or you get the opportunity to participate in both? Right. I don't think that they'll get that opportunity. You have to give up one to take the other. Mm -hmm. Just because of the size. Oh, yeah. Okay. I think well, that the new sports, the whole modernization and all these youth sports that are taking place in the Olympics and the three-on-three -three basketball and all these new oh. ideas, it seems like it's a great, you know, different ways of imagining new yeah. ways. And, though, and those are the changes that are taking place in society today that we have to consider. Uh, and I don't want to pick on one sport, but I see some of the changes that are taking place, say, in alpine skiing, where there's head-to-head -head races and a shorter course, and, you, and the fans can see it the whole time, uh, as opposed to sitting at the bottom of the hill and uh, watching one person come down a downhill and you see him for a flash. So those kinds of changes are, are taking place, which I think is great for sport, and it's what's happening in society, and, and it's what young people growing up are participating in. Uh, I've always felt that uh, sports for our athletes, we need to be more imaginative, particularly in our winter sports. Mm -hmm. Our winter Paralympic Games are way too small. Mm -hmm. And I, don't, I wouldn't want to see more sports being put into the summer games when we can really build up uh, our winter games more. And I know that, uh, for example, and a good inclusive sport that uh, some people still don't really... Um, give it the kind of respect that it has earned is wheelchair dance. Hmm. I mean, here's a sport where there's able-bodied and disabled. It's very competitive. The athletes are highly trained. It is a recognized sport uh, within the Paralympics. That would be an ideal sport because it can happen indoors, it could happen winter or summer. You could insert that to me personally very easily into the Winter Paralympic Games. Hmm. And I've been at uh, uh, many of the international world championships for wheelchair dance, they're unbelievably, they're great. Eli, I'm just I'm looking at the clock and recognizing that we're almost... Yeah, just do a little wrap up and yeah, maybe some thoughts on the next steps. And yeah. yeah, so we're not going to... I'm sorry for the people that are sending questions in online. We're not going to be able to, to get to them. But I, I think if nothing else, they provide great fodder for future conversations as to whether or not uh, Esports is an opportunity for further, con you know, consideration. Um, mm. and, and I did, I did see the the comments about Dragon Ball. Yeah, Dragon Ball. Yeah. We'll commit, we'll commit an entire uh, <laughs> next conversation. Just, just to that. Um, I want to finish with first of all uh, expressing our thanks to you, Doctor Sedward, for being the first of what what Eli and I have coined the Sedward Talks. With without your agreement. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate uh, you're still laughing like you're a graduate student, right? <laughs> you have a trademark. A trademark. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate you letting us use your name without you agreeing to do so. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm wanting to th you to think about and just even perhaps guide Eli and I, because again, this is our, our inaugural, uh, inaugural attempt. Where mm -hmm. can we go with this? Where do you think something like this uh, can take us as, as, again, trying to better understand the intersection between the Olympic and Paralympic movements. For education, for awareness. Well, to me, uh, uh, the root of a lot of challenges that we have uh, within any organization, any movement is communication. And uh, we've now embarked on, on one aspect uh, of communicating with the movement uh, through this medium. We've got a number of people online asking questions, a number of people in the room here. So I think it's a great opportunity to uh, reflect on the past, but more so to, uh, to provide opportunities uh, to resolve the challenges and take up the opportunities for the future. And, and by bringing in uh, other people, whether it's the researchers uh, at universities that uh, that's drastically missing. We need many, many more researchers in sport for athletes living with a disability to resolve those issues uh, and to get the opinions of, and, uh, and thoughts of other people around the world who are dealing with the social change and sport change and, and in the different uh, uh, countries in Africa, Asia, South America, whatever have you. So you're, the two of you are to be congratulated for initiating <laughs> this, and uh, I certainly hope it, uh, it gets wings and continues. 
Well, Eli, I'm going to turn it back to you to do a final, final summary. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you both. And of course, Dr. Studward. And yeah, we're really excited about this opportunity to have these conversations, to capture history, um, to, to look at the present, look at the future. I'm getting different perspectives. I um, want to thank everyone who's joined us online. And of course, our in person there, having the live studio. We have the and, yeah. Eli, I just want to like yeah, we'll do. the crowd has grown as as it's occurred. We've I mean, we've got we've got 25, 25 people sitting in the room here listening to us. Excellent. Yeah, we're gonna have the recording posted, you know, online on disability and sport. I think of FAPA as well. And but it's it's gonna be available to be shared. Um, and then we'll we haven't set the the dates for our next conversation, but I think we're looking at perhaps quarterly. Um, that we'll be able to arrange some really interesting conversations. So I guess without further ado, we'll, we'll thank everybody and thank you, Dr. Stedward. And I don't know, David, any, or Dr. Stedward, any other remarks before we can close? Well, just, I, I'm just reading some of the comments that we're getting here. Um, apparently, FAP is gonna host this on the, their YouTube channel. So there Perfect. you go. Yeah, we can do that, easy. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be trending. <laughs> yeah, we'll use thank the you. hashtag, yeah. That's right. Yeah. And thank you so much to everybody for participating. This has been great. Appreciate it. Excellent. Okay. I'll be closing out now. All right. Bye-bye.